Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill out our survey to be in with a chance of winning a prize. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendays.org.uk forward slash survey. We hope you enjoy this event. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and see me. Um, welcome to Hodger Huisht, Who Gets to Speak in Scottish Heritage. My name is Ingrid Shearer and I am the Heritage Engagement Officer for Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. Uh, this will be quite a fast paced event. We've got a lot to get through, uh, but there might be a chance to, to overrun a little bit past the half past three deadline. Now we're recording this as Stephen said and we'll also be archiving the chat and making that available after the event. Um, in the chat room is Dr Natasha Ferguson and Dr Alan Leslie uh, and they'll be joining us in person or on screen at the end and uh, Karen Maley Watt has very kindly compiled some links and resources so we'll be sharing those too. Um, to give you a little bit of context, um, myself, Natasha, Alan and Karen have been working on this over the past two or three months. I've been thinking about it for a while and I saw an opportunity in the Doors Open Days Festival, firstly to impose a deadline because nothing sharpens the mind faster than a deadline, um, but also to tap into that, uh, that wider heritage audience to look at perceptions of gender representation outside of the academy, outside of, of big heritage organisations and, and museums. And this is maybe uh, what's a little bit different about this event um, and the research that we've been doing. We're approaching this from the perspective that, that we're all heritage enthusiasts and there's a, a commonality to the experience as audience members, whether you're a professional, a volunteer, you're just interested, we all watch documentaries, we all go to talks and events, visit museums, read books and magazines, and, and we're all subject to bias. I realised pretty early on that it was going to be far too much for, for me on my own, um, and it's really the kind of project that should be a, a collaborative thing anyway. So we formed a, a wee collective, and the four of us have been working on this um, in, the, in the cracks and hollows over the past few months, evenings, weekends. This is very much uh, a work in progress. 
it's not comprehensive and it's not slick. This is not a TED talk, uh, but it does provide a useful snapshot. And, and I'm hoping it's going to com complement uh, or challenge some of the studies and initiatives around gender and representation within the, the professional and sort of sectoral side of heritage. So our <clears throat> goals for today, firstly, to get that, that discussion kick-started. Um, I guess to kind of challenge audiences to think a little bit more critically about the heritage that they're engaging with, and also to start making links um, with, with other groups that are, that are working around the same sort of themes. So a little bit about the format for this afternoon. So um, I'm going to run through some of our uh, initial findings and observations, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Tara Bell, who'll be telling us uh, about the protests and suffragettes project. We'll then begin the panel discussion. That's going to be uh, kind of split into two sections. So the first half will be um, a bit of focused discussion around some of the findings and observations from the survey, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. Again, we can potentially run over a little bit, so I'll try and not cut the discussion down in its, in its prime. Um, turning back to the research, when we, uh, when we put the survey out about a fortnight ago now, we, we focused on, um, on perceptions of women and gender as opposed to, to lived experience. And I think that's what's really come through in, in the survey is the realities. The, the associations and assumptions around gender and how that intersects with um, roles and authority, recognition and attribution, and also um, sort of areas of interest or, or topics in heritage. And inevitably we'll also be touching on how women are represented in the past. We've attempted to, as far as possible to take a, an intersectional approach class, age, ethnicity, and geography all have a major impact on access to and, uh, and our experiences of heritage. At this stage, the data that, that we have available um, is, is heavily gender focused and we would like to do more, but that current data set that we have, a lot of it's been um, gathered from sort of speakers lists and um, it's not possible to get really neo nuanced uh, information from that. I think the other thing to say is for the, for the purposes of this study and event, we are looking to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and and the, the term women is encompassing anyone who, who uh, identifies as such. Now, issues arising and around representation are certainly not unique to heritage. Across the board, male is the default. It is pernicious and largely unchallenged. And anything that breaks out of that norm is, is still tends to be characterized as either minority or, or marginal histories. And I think there's, <clears throat> there's an irony here. Heritage is an area where we really should be doing better. People engaged with heritage are generally have a, have a greater awareness of, of context and the importance of context and maybe a little bit more reflective and analytical in their thinking. Um, and critically, I think they have an understanding that value systems are fluid, cultural values, social values are constantly changing and evolving. So if you're able to imagine different pasts, then you should really be able to imagine different futures. And apart from anything else, actively removing ignoring or overlooking half the population from your stories is just simply bad research. It's bad heritage. So on to our own research. <laughs> there's, uh, there's three main components to this. Um, analysis of speakers lists from talks and conferences uh, of, sort of local and national heritage societies and groups. We've done a little bit of media analysis, including, <clears throat> including a couple of uh, case studies, and then we'll get on to um, some of the findings from the survey. So I'm just going to share the screen now. Uh, okay. Just bear with me for a second.
Okay. So who gets to speak in heritage? Now, <clears throat> the data that we've pulled together um, has been gathered from a range of different sources. Um, a lot of it's been web-based, um, some of it's been from uh, newsletters, but it's it's mostly been quite, quite dispersed, quite ephemeral, um, and it's often very difficult to find kind of cross-comparable data, particularly across the, the sector. Um, having said that, there are, there are clear patterns emerging. Um, and I think one of the other issues um, that we have <laughs> is finding the time to bring all this stuff together. And in terms of uh, accessing some of those source materials and um, and the kind of uh, technical tools for analysis, I think particularly for, for some of the media analysis stuff, it's been it's been very tricky and uh, we might need to enlist some, some other people to help us out with that down the line. So what you're seeing here is a snapshot of speakers lists for their, their sort of regular lecture programs over the last five years. And we've selected um, five groups, or oh no, six groups there. Um, we do have a lot of data from other organizations, but uh, at this point it's not cross comparable either. There was duplication um, in terms of sectoral emphasis or there just wasn't enough um, information to do that five years. Um, having said that, there is a general pattern uh, that's kind of emerging across the board, and that is that generally around about 20 to 30 percent of, of speakers are women. Again, we can't really break that down any further at the moment. Um, so you can see there's two exceptions to the pattern. Glasgow City Heritage Trust are doing pretty well. They're uh, almost a, a gender balanced program. And Scotland's Community Heritage Conference um, are leading the way there. Um, so more women speakers than men. Uh, I should also just clarify that uh, the Community Heritage Conference um, includes workshops, guided walks, panel discussions and the like. So um, for that, we've included basically anyone that's kind of taken a lead role. But yeah, well done. Um, at the other end of the scale, however, uh, we have two very august societies, Glasgow Archaeological Society and the Society of Antiquities of Scotland, um, maybe not doing quite so well. Um, so, uh, GAS have had five women, women speakers um, from the lists that we were able to access dating back to 1905, and only one has been in the last decade. Uh, the Rhine lectures, both both of these lecture sets are the kind of um, uh, the the kind of prestige gigs. <laughs> they have an ordinary program of lectures as well, but these are the ones where they um, they get the really big prestige speakers in. So the Rhines have had eight women speakers in the last decade, um, but six of those were in one series in 2015. So it has kind of skewed things. It's great that they, they started to address that, but it, it's um, the, the overall picture is not brilliant. Um, Natasha did a little uh, media analysis using History Scotland magazine. Uh, having, <laughs> having noticed a theme across four or five consecutive uh, magazines, uh, that there were a lot of profiles of powerful men and a lot of um, hashtag men with swords. Uh, so she highlighted that on Twitter and got a response back from History Scotland and they they'd noted that trend and promised to put more women on the front cover, um, which they did uh, for the next issue. Um, and she then took that a little bit more in depth and did a rapid fire survey of five issues to look at the number of male authors to female authors within um, within an issue. So um, we're looking at about two thirds male authors to female authors uh, and one co-written. She also had a look at subject areas by author. And in general, there's a, there's a fairly good spread, but there were particular themes highlighted, particularly military history, archeology, span 
and biographical history tended to be dominated by male authors um, and articles on archives tended to, um, to be dominated by women. Uh, within the biographical histories, three were written by, written by women, but all biographies featured were about men. Um, having said that, there is a little bit of balance in, in the magazine, and they are um, particularly good on representation for uh, early career researchers, and particularly women, um, and they have a uh, sort of, yeah, promoting, promoting early career um, research. So that's good. Uh, we're now on to another little case study. This is the STV People's History Show. So this was looking at data from one single series. And again, there is um, a, a balance across uh, presenters, but you, but you see a big skew then when you go to those kind of experts as talking heads. I mean, probably pretty typical across the board. So I'm going to have a really rapid run through of the, the kind of initial survey findings now. So first off, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone who circulated it and who filled it in. We were really, really stunned at the response and not just the, the response in terms of the numbers who, who were filling it in, but the time and the consideration that people put into their responses. Um, so we opened it on September the 1st. There were 10 questions designed to get an insight into perceptions and experience of women in heritage. And it was open to, to all genders. Um, we'll probably um, regroup and reflect on, on the survey more after this event. This is, this is a kind of first pass, um, a, a rapid overview. Um, and I have to say special thanks to, to uh, Tash and Alan for doing so much of this, this work. So we had 346 respondents in total. Um, and uh, quite a diverse spectrum there in terms of, of gender identity. Um, however, uh, the, the vast majority did identify as either male or female. And for the purposes of this survey, survey we did amalgamate a lot of the categories just to allow for a bit of cross correlation uh, between later responses. And that, that work is, is still ongoing. Um, in terms of age of respondents, we were very low in the 18 to 24 category. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, we, we're just not maybe reaching that constituency through the channels that we used. Um, maybe they don't think that they have enough experience um, to respond or don't think it's an issue or maybe just don't like filling in forms. Um, yeah, we'll need to kind of reflect on that down the line. Question three, um, I think in retrospect, given it's a kind of self-selecting survey, you would expect to have um, people frequently attending heritage events. So I would probably not have bothered putting that in, in yeah, in retrospect. Um, we deliberately uh, didn't distinguish between professional, non-professional volunteers or whatever, because of that um, emphasis on that kind of shared experience of, of heritage. I think it was useful. So um, what you're seeing here um, is uh, multiple choice. So this will be representing people working across maybe two or three areas of interest um, or involvement. Uh, of the, the people who answered other, uh, we had responses from people working in communications and marketing, uh, local authority planning, ecclesiastical, uh, genealogy and, and immersive uh, technologies. Um, yeah, so this has not been cross correlated against gender yet, but again, with that, that um, very broad brush breakdown of, of uh, say, so around about two thirds female to a third male. Um, yeah, we can see kind of bigger, uh, wider scale patterns there. Um, and I think we can probably infer from the responses that actually we've had quite a big response from uh, maybe people who are working professionally in, in heritage um, and that they've been maybe asked to, to talk or, or certainly have a lot of experience in, in heritage already. 
Now, it's really, uh, once you get into the later questions, um, that you really get into the meat of this. Um, and we're still, we're still working through this material. The qualitative responses were fantastic. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, uh, most people said that they didn't feel that gender had affected their opportunities, but then qualified it. Uh, and from, from women's perspectives, uh, the people who said yes, it had affected their opportunities, it was mostly referenced as, as having been having had a negative impact, whereas men um, uh, being being male was, was seen as a, as, as a beneficial thing. Um, again, we had a fair spread across uh, uh, whether people thought that there was fair gender representation. Um, I think, oh, lost my notes here. Um, and similarly, Again, um, most people were either neutral or disagreed that there were heritage topics that people believe were, were off limits or contentious. But then once you kind of drilled down into it, you got a little bit more, more feedback there. Um, and there were certain subjects that, that came up time and again. So military history, warfare um, and architecture and built environment. Um, whereas museums and collections and education, I guess um, some of that relates to um, perceptions around roles um, that, that women tend to be associated with um, some of the kind of soft skills, um, like, you know, the kind of public engagement side, um, outreach and education. Um, and there were far fewer subjects were identified as, as, as being associated with, with women than men. Interestingly, uh, everybody is put off by mammals, which is, was really good to hear, actually. Um, and uh, most people were not put off, uh, or, or they said they were not put off attending or watching an event because of the gender of, of the presenter. Now, in terms of the last question, there was a lot of material came out of that, and, and we will be sharing uh, more uh, detail from the survey as the as the analysis goes on but we had some really interesting responses and we've kind of um, had a, again a first pass at, uh, at looking at ways that that we could be more effective um, in uh, achieving gender equity so um, that just a, a broadening and, and widening of um, yeah themes and subject areas, uh, anything to get new voices into the sector and kind of and, and reinvigorate it. Um, and taking a lead from Glasgow Women's Library and some new initiatives like Space Invaders, which we'll be hearing a little bit about um, later on today. Um, somebody had suggested it was the responsibility of event orgers to build in equity at an early stage. I think that that early stage intervention is really critical as well. Uh, it needs to be absolutely integrated into the events, talks, lectures, conferences, um, whatever you're doing, you need to be thinking about that straight, straight from, the, from the off. Um, there is also an acknowledgement that there needs to be more responsibility um, from our um, media people to offer more opportunities to highlight women in heritage. Um, and a couple of people did suggest that heritage is very risk averse in terms of um, encouraging uh, women into the sector. I would, yeah, I would say that's just a general um, observation about the heritage sector being quite risk averse. Uh, more women in senior management roles um, and also starting to uh, tackle some of these issues from a, from a young age. There were also quite a lot of people highlighted the, uh, the lack of diversity in general is an issue and it's not, 
exclusive to gender. We would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, now, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. So, um, now, just so that we're not all uh, instantly depressed from that, um, I'm going to bring in Dr. Tara Bell to uh, tell us about protests and suffragettes. Tara is a socially engaged artist, researcher and heritage consultant based in Dumfries and Galloway. She works with diverse communities on uh, durational projects to recover marginalised histories. She's currently lead artist for protests and suffragettes and her work spans a variety of media, including performative events, printed matter and creative interventions in the public realm. Her PhD with the University of Glasgow in 2017 was collaborating with the Riverside Museum and Glasgow Museums and her practice led research uh, developed engagement strategies for heritage institutions through co curated events and participatory practice. Um, I thought Tara was a really great fit for this event, um, the, the protests and suffragettes project, and in particular what she's going to be talking about, um, which is uh, their Wikipedia editing. So I will hand over now to Tara. Thank you, Ingrid, very much. Um, and that's, yeah, thank you also for the opportunity to be here and for the survey data and kind of walking us through that, obviously quite a lot to digest and um, very much looking forward to the conversation um, that will ensue. I'm gonna speak just for a few minutes, probably about seven minutes about the Protest and Suffragettes Project. And I'm just gonna um, flap about here for a second and see if I can share my screen and then after that, we'll just go quickly. Um, I think, there we are. Um, I think I'm, as Ingrid said, I'm supposed to, to give a tiny bit of uh, <laughs> positivity within all of that incredibly um, complex data. So I will do my best. Um, Protests and Suffragettes is a creative heritage project led by myself alongside a team of artists, activists, and local historians. And we are working to recover the histories of women activists in Govan specifically, um, and more recently um, kind of expanding out into Glasgow. I'm the lead artist, as Ingrid said, and I started the project in 2013. So what I'm gonna do is provide a very brief background to some of our creative work and then I'm gonna speak specifically about our work with Wikipedia and Wikimedia UK as a way, um, as a kind of an example of something that we're doing to impact or to begin to soften as much as possible the gender bias and the dominant heritage narratives within which we are working. So our work and research focuses, like I said, on recovering really the actions, but also on revoicing the words of women involved in protest movements in Govan for the last hundred years. So we're starting roughly um, at the 1915 rent strikes and including up through suffrage, um, the Women's Peace Crusades, the 1971 Upper Clyde Shipbuilders Work In, and more recent actions. And we recently, there we go. So yeah, that's a sort of a, a soft list of some of the things um, that we have been researching and we keep it quite rooted. It's quite locally rooted, I would say. Um, we have only just um, during the pandemic um, started to broaden out and we recently have been running a crowdfunder, um, developing resources to, or crowdfunding for producing educational resources for Scottish suffrage and that's, uh, I'm delighted to say that closed <laughs> Monday at midnight. <laughs> Um, and we did make our target, so that is definitely happening. So I'm going to just go quickly forward and talk a little bit about the art walks that we've been doing in Govan locally, and then, like I said, move on to speaking a little bit about Wikipedia. So I call these art walks, they're kind of a cross between a guided walk and a performative happening, which we've developed um, over the work that we've been doing. 
in these, we are revoicing specifically these women's words back into the spaces and places where they would have been living and working. In, in so doing, we employ quite a lot of creative interventions. That includes things like the Occupy Movement's human megaphone, um, which we use as a kind of a call and response technique. We also employ temporary graffiti. You can see there we've, we've um, renamed the streets. Um, in honor of Mary Barber. We include chalking, which we've really lifted from the suffragettes. I'm gonna go quicker through some pictures. Um, we also conduct in-depth archival research and when it's possible to do so, oral history. So this is us walking past the John Elder statue in Elder Park. And while we are walking by one of our members, Lydia Levitt is chalking his wife was pure dead Gallus. We also make posters and publish zines. We often have music as part of our walks and we commission or carry or both banners celebrating some of the women that we have been researching. This is a timeline of Mary Barber's life, which we chalk again with temporary chalk paint in front of her statue which was unveiled in 2018. And as part of our crowdfunder, but also in general with other work that we're doing, we're self-publishing zines and posters. And we're producing a set of Scottish suffragettes, sort of Trump's style playing cards, which I'm very excited about. Right, so onto our work with Wikipedia and Wikimedia UK. We hosted our first Wikipedia workshop at Glasgow Women's Library in 2016 with Dr. Sarah Thomas. That's her at the top left of your screen. All of our workshops employ um, and involve some training. So it's not necessary for you to have any previous information coming in. We are also in the process of doing that work. We've hosted three Wikipedia workshops during lockdown from yeah, June to now. The, the last one was literally last week. All of our workshops include a training session, like I said, apologies. Um, and within these, these workshops, we are also opening up our, our sort of seven year archive. So we have an archive of, of, of resources. We also have a long list um, of people, women, um, activists who are not on Wikipedia or whose Wikipedia article could use substantial improvement. Um, and in that process, we are basically both training up more people to be working on Wikipedia, as well as increasing the diversity of information that is available on Wiki. So I wanna say a tiny bit about why we are working with Wikipedia, and then that's, that's actually gonna be me done. Um, I think Wikipedia, it's, some of these points are obvious, so I apologize for, for saying the obvious, but I think it's still worth um, sort of really focusing in on them. Wikipedia, our work, with Wikipedia allows our project substantially more reach. It gives longevity to our research. I'm aware that there are a lot of people um, who maybe are thinking about or watching this from, from a heritage perspective who will be aware that, for example, if you have funding from the Heritage Fund, your funded project is required to have a website which is up for five years. But what happens after that five year period, um, that, that website, that research, that work, those oral histories, potentially are hard to access thereafter. So getting work, um, getting our research onto Wiki is an excellent way to increase longevity and reach. Um, we also consider this really to be a form of knowledge activism. The English Wikipedia, and by that I mean the Wikipedia written in English, currently reflects the existing biases, gender, race, class that are flagrant in the dominant historical narratives. And I'll just give you an example. Um, as of September, as of now, 18 and a half percent of all biographies on English Wikipedia are of women. 
it's obvious that these gaps in knowledge, these existing biases are not going to be accidentally fleshed out. Or this is, I guess I should say this is my opinion, but I think it's a, a pretty, pretty standard point. And we have to really actively press in and, and get down to the business of changing the heritage narratives that are around us. And Wikipedia is one powerful tool for beginning to enact those changes. And I really would encourage you, as this slide says, to become a knowledge activist um, in all of the ways that that means. I think that's something that we all need to think about. Um, those of us who are working within the heritage sector, those of us who are consuming heritage information. Um, in her talk as part of Glasgow Doors Open Day on Tuesday, which I really highly recommend, um, Sarah Thomas, who's the person that we've had the pri privilege of working with, noted that certain types of knowledge are given more authority than others, and that this re-entrenches existing gaps in knowledge on sources like Wikipedia. I think she also speaks really eloquently about the act of learning to edit Wikipedia. And this absolutely is reflected within my experience. And I think the experience of the, the, the Protest and Suffragettes Project team and other volunteers that I've worked with, um, that as you learn to edit Wiki, you move in a way from being consumers to producers of knowledge. Um, and this is a powerful example of heritage agency, in my opinion. That is a real, it's a real issue of knowledge equity. Um, I think the other thing I want to say, and this is also something that um, Sarah covered in her talk, and she has taken this from Ewan McAndrew, who is the Wikimedian in residence at Edinburgh University. Um, and he makes this point, I think, quite beautifully in this slide that the more we make histories visible, the more visible they become, ironically. So the more that things are visible on Wikipedia, the more they become visible to Google. We know, for example, that Google and things like Alexa, if you're using those, those types of, of resources, they are pulling from Wikipedia as a first point of information. The more they are visible on Google, the more they are written about, the more they are visible to the public, the more they can then be sourced and referenced again on Wikipedia. Um, and you have this kind of loop there. So in terms of our project, and that, that's then me finished, I think Protests and Suffragettes is, I think, very committed to continuing to work with Wikipedia. And I think I want to just say that that doesn't mean that everyone involved in your institution, your heritage project, your um, kind of team or group of volunteers needs to be an expert, needs to even be that involved. But as a group of people, I think this is one really powerful um, method um, for starting to shave off or redress some of the imbalances that are, that are everywhere in the dominant historical record. And I will pass back to Ingrid with that. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Oops, there we go. That's me. Now I'll stop and pass over to Ingrid. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's it. Um, have you stopped sharing? Yeah, okay. Trying, there we go. Excellent, right. Okay, well, um, you can stay on screen now and I think we'll start bringing all our other panelists in and uh, I'll do some introductions. Okay, so just start. Oh no, actually I have to ask all you guys to unmute and um, and bring your turn your video on, please. Hey. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, um, so I'm just going to do uh, a little round robin uh, of the introductions here, just as I see people on the screen. Um, so Giovanna Vitelli has a PhD in historical archaeology from the University of Reading as of 2019. She is the head of collections and curatorial at the Hunterian at the University of Glasgow, having to uh, come to Scotland from the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, Giovanna, oh, where's Giovanna gone? Oh, there you are, sorry, <laughs> give us a wave. Uh, okay, and Loretta. Uh, Loretta Mordi is Learning and Engagement Manager uh, with significant experience at senior management level and a strong record in strategic development, project management and delivery in cultural heritage and public policies spanning over 20 years. She's currently responsible for driving strategic learning and engagement through supporting the sector and partnerships to deliver the national strategy for Scotland museums and Scottish government national policies. 
a great networker committed to museums, cultural learning and community engagement, equality and diversity, social justice and inclusion. Uh, she also convenes the Museums Gallery Scotland Strategic Learning Forum, and she is an associate of Museums Association. Hi, Loretta. Thank you. Uh, okay, as project officer for Colourful Heritage, uh, Dr. Uh, Sakeb Razak, where are you at? Hi. <laughs> uses her research skills to trace the roots of early South Asian uh, migrants that came to settle in Scotland, capturing and celebrating their unique inspirational stories. She's been instrumental in setting up the Glaswegians exhibition at Scotland Street School Museum and recently delivered a lecture, The Contribution of South Asians to Scotland, as part of this year's inaugural South Asian Heritage Fund. Most recently, she's organised Colourful Heritage's Her Story series, highlighting the stories of pioneering South Asian women in Scotland. And we also have um, Graham and Alan Forbes. Um, they're brothers, they come as a set. Uh, and they run uh, Up Next Studios in Glasgow, making a variety of TV programmes and content, but they're also responsible for, um, for a lot of the People's History Show sections. Um, and behind the scenes, so in the chat room, we have Dr. Natasha Ferguson. She's post excavation manager at Guard Archaeology, um, based in Govan, specializes in conflict archaeology and material culture uh, of medieval to early modern Scotland. Um, somewhere online, though not in the chat room, because I think she's at work today, is Karen Maley Watt, who's also been um, very heavily involved in this. She's a feminist researcher and historian, she's currently an arts funded PhD student at the University of Glasgow and the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, but before returning to academia in 2016, she worked in the museum and heritage sector for over a decade. And she is also one half of the History Girls of Scotland, which is they have a website, Twitter, um, check them out. And finally, we have Dr. Alan Leslie, um, heritage practitioner for 30 years, working in academia, tertiary education and archaeological contracting and consultancy. He is one of the founding members, uh, founding directors of Inherit, uh, the Institute for Heritage and Sustainable Human Development and also Northlight Heritage. And before that, was managing director of Guard and a lecturer in archaeology at the University of Glasgow. I haven't forgotten anybody, have I? No. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and we're almost kind of sticking to time as well. This is a minor miracle. Um, so I'm just going to get things started off here with an easy question to get us um, to get us going. So if you can all um, you can all uh, unmute yourselves and we'll just get cracking. I think. Um, was there anything that surprised you um, in some of the findings from that survey? Does anybody want to take that? You know, I, think, I think there's still quite a lot to actually ingest from some of the survey. Um, there's a lot of information. Yeah. I mean, we will, we will be publishing this at some point. It's just it's very it's very high level um, at the moment. I was I was quite surprised at um, at the response uh, from men to manals. They were really quite um, uh, quite vocal about how fed up they are with them, which was really nice to hear, actually, um, because there is, there is that kind of assumption that it's just. Uh, women that are, that are sick of them, but yeah, it, it has a negative impact on on men too. Oh, hi, Giovanna. One of the really interesting things that I picked up and that we're picking up across, that I've been picking up for years doing other surveys, is visibility. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the uh, key issues that I've been working with with other foundations is the idea of a diversity pipeline. It's this idea that people can see into their futures the kinds of people who are already there, who they want to be, mm -hmm. and whether that's women or people from ethnic minorities, that diversity pipe, that visibility is, is what I'm picking up from the survey that's kind of missing. 
and it's obviously coming up from the initial data as well, the quant data. Mm. Um, that's something I'd really, I'd, for myself anyway, want to focus on. Yeah, um, it, it was good to, to see people highlighting um, that, that A, uh, putting a little bit of, of pressure on, on the media to be more representative, but also um, thinking in terms of, um, you know, for kids and young people, you know, you really, you want to be what you see. And if you don't see yourself represented, then it, it just it knocks out that aspiration completely um, and that interest as well. It's not even necessarily about, I, I want to be a, I want to be an archaeologist when I grow up or, or whatever, but you know, there are, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see people who look like me who are archaeologists. It's also that uh, just, just interest levels. Um, and again, that, that came through, I think, very strongly that um, people are quite fed up with um, hearing from the same people and, and seeing, hearing the same subject matter kind of rehearsed over and over again. I think there is an appetite for, for new projects and new voices. Would you, would you agree with that? I think I think you get a feel that people already, even men. I mean, let, let me just put it this way: looking at you know information given, they are reading them through. It just shows you know that sometimes when you think you're doing things for one particular agenda or the other, and you expected only the gender people, you know, kind that type of gender to respond. You also hear men talking about this. I'm always worried when we talk about a particular gender or a particular ethnic, you know, are we actually then saying we are against the other gender? But it's also good that was this service has been so inclusive in terms of, you know, it's open there. Get involved, let's hear what you think. So it's coming from both sides, you know, and both sides have been very genuine in terms of what it is, you know, the unconscious bias on both sides and mm -hmm. that was coming out very clear in yeah. terms of you know people how people are articulating things and I, I i mean i think it's a lot of information they are very detailed there is a lot to take out of it and then um, diversity and inclusion inclusive practices coming out strongly on both sides in terms of where do you start approaches start early age you know or what so yeah 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 um, I wonder if um, maybe Alan or Graham could pitch in a little bit from the from the media side. Uh, there's something how, much, how much responsibility do you do you feel in terms of what you're putting out there into the public domain in uh, terms of sort of representation? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think of it in terms of a responsibility. I think. Um, we're a production company, so you know we make uh, programming for uh, broadcasters. Um, uh, sometimes they're online, sometimes they're uh, TV channels like um, STV or BBC or Channel Five, something like that. And um, I think it's it would be nice to think that we could uh, go to a broadcaster and make demands of them and say we think this should be this and this should be that. But it, I'm afraid it's not how it works for us. We're not in that position. We don't have that kind of clout. I don't know um, any other production companies around here. Uh, maybe there are, but we don't have that. So um, the, the broadcasters have a responsibility to their audiences and to get their um, audience figures. Uh, those audience figures are measured by an independent company called Barb. And uh, basically everybody who works at that broadcaster, mm -hmm. be it um, BBC, uh, who have a responsibility to everybody who pays their license fee, or a commercial channel like STV or Channel 5 or Channel 4. Um, they have responsibility to their advertisers. Um, and I think, um, I think you know, we, we obviously don't represent the broadcasters in any way. Um, there are lots of media production companies around and uh, we are one of them. Uh, I hope that every project that we approach, we try to um, get a diverse range of voices into, into each program that we make. But Honestly, I don't feel like that's from, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no quotas or anything. We don't sit and try and say we should have these different voices. I think it just makes pieces more interesting and more enjoyable to watch when we hear from different people 
who can bring something different to a story. And, uh, you know, there, there are some times when we kind of do notice we're like, okay, we've got quite a few of this, quite a few similar voices in this piece. And we notice it from a production standpoint. And it does make us think, right, how can we, how can we explore this in a different way? And who can we hear from that's going to be interesting? Um, but I would say responsibility for us is maybe the wrong word. I think if you want to speak about responsibility, you maybe have to talk to people at broadcasters who actually are putting that content out. Because at the end of the day, um, we make content for a broadcaster. We make a commissioned project. And to be honest, if I, if I go to a commissioner and I say, uh, thanks very much for asking us to make this, this history documentary, but I am going to take out the people you've asked and put other people in. And I'm sorry, they're not going to put that on TV for me. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a balancing act. There are lots of things um, that we have to, um, we, have, we have a lot of different things to serve. So for example, in the People's History Show, a big part of that remit is that we um, visit all parts of Scotland. Mm. And that actually, if you think about um, the, the, the range of stories that are available, sometimes from very small areas, it does make, um, it, does make it quite a challenge in the, the research phase, finding um, diverse stories from some parts of Scotland. And, um, you know, it's a challenge that we are, we are totally up for and we speak to lots of people about, but um, there are lots of various uh, concerns that we have to take on board um, from distributors, mm -hmm. from broadcasters, anybody who's commissioning a project, basically. When, when it's a project that we're just deciding to do ourselves and we've got a bit more control over, then uh, yeah, we, we do try to make sure we have different voices, but. I think that it just makes a better program. So you're not gatekeepers. I'm afraid not. I wish. Uh, I don't wish I was that. We still like making content. Maybe one day we will be. But, but no. Yeah. You, must, you must have a bit of a wiggle room there, Tara. Have you got your hand up there? Yeah. Yeah. Please. I think I just. Do you mind if I just press in on that a little bit? That point. I'm sorry, Graham. I think. Um, I think. It's potentially because I did my doctorate in museums. Um, so my, my, my visioning of the way in which heritage narratives are codified um, is quite precisely museum focused, I guess I would have to say, you know, that's my, my kind of my training background bit. Um, but I think, you know, what I, what we, what we came up against constantly within those types of conversations, just to soften the approach pattern a little bit to what I'm about to say, um, is that um, you know, museums are, are limited in their own definition of what is possible in terms of what they can represent. Yeah, they're making these definitions of what is possible. That's issue one, right? They, 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 they have to use the objects that are in their collection already to create new displays. But if their collection is full of objects that are predominantly about and collected by um, you know, white British, the people, the people who wrote the same histories that we are trying to sort of begin to soften, yeah, and trouble and nuance, um, then it becomes quite difficult to create new displays unless you change the definition of what is considered to be an object, for example, within a museum, or what is considered to be the kind of, the, you, have to, you have to shift slightly the parameters within the, the arena that you are you are considering. And so I think um, my, my, my sense is that it's very difficult to take responsibility for the creation of content and to say that actually, yes, I am someone who's producing knowledge. I am literally, here I am literally producing heritage knowledge, but actually that's kind of the gig for most of the people on the panel. And we all have to personally take responsibility for what we're putting out. You know, that's, I know it's a, it's a real absolutist sense, but I just think it's, it's not, as I said, you know, I, I, it, this is not going to like suddenly magically change these, these issues are not going to disappear on their own. Like we, we have to decide that it is a priority and push. Yeah. Sorry, Loretta. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm staying around this too, but it's going to be quick, but I'm not going to shift away completely. It's just to bring another dimension, thinking about media, mass media here. Um, things are changing. We've been seeing, you know, I mean, this, that we're even having this conversation is, is brilliant. 
because we really do need to be having the space to look at what is and where we have been in terms of where we've been coming from in terms of equalities. It's been very, very small changes, but yeah, maybe in the right direction. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't have that kind of, we all have that kind of responsibility in our own ways. And we have to look at the subject areas and the like. I have taken this, I'm taking this, you know, just share this little experience of mine. Um, I haven't worked from, you know, my background is also broadcasting and I've been, been trained, you know, by, you know, um, maybe in France and BBC in itself. Nigeria, I come from Nigeria and I worked in the TV, radio TV station. I was the first woman news director for the national news in television at that time. All of the workforce there, all of those kind of technical area works are specifically for men. It's just kind of, you know, perception that women don't or won't do those work well. But things, you know, begin to change as well in terms of, you know, Let's try, let's give opportunities to people. How are those people are gonna change things? Who are, well, how are we gonna do it? How are we going to represent stories across the board? So it's not just about you know, looking at the men, focusing on certain contents. It's also about you know, bringing in women uh, or any other you know, people with different expertise, background, opportunity to actually be part of you know, the conversation and contribute to that and make those changes. Since I became that, other women have been inspired. Other young, wi young women have been inspired, or young girls at that time, at my own age at that time, have been inspired. And we've been part of you know, production, news production, and make contributions in terms of determining what comes you know, to, to the ear, what we use slides, and all of those areas of content. So in essence, it's the same thing with museums or the heritage organizations. If you are looking at context, if those, if those objects, you know, are there, are being actually uh, interpreted by the same kind of people who probably will look at it from one dimension and don't see areas of, you know, content that, you know, other gender or ethnicity or whatever be become part of it. We tend to then, it becomes that we are being narrowed down in things that we need to tell in terms of representation there. So I'm just adding the fact that actually, it's not just about one side of the story. It's all about, you know, how do you get the other representation? And I like the bit about the, you know, Wikimedia and the resident MGS funded, you know, uh, partnership program and that for that. So I think, you know, all I'm saying is that it's everybody's responsibility yeah. in terms of, you know, how we move this forward. Yeah. Oh. Giovanna. I, I don't think we want to keep this too much on museums because obviously heritage is a much, much wider field. Um, what I would say is I think that what applies to museums and heritage is something that we haven't talked about, which is letting go control of the narrative, which is very much, I think, what Loretta is talking about, and what Tara is talking about, and what we try to practice, which is co-production. Mm -hmm. It's 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 co-production is a step on the way to letting go control. And it's something that we find very difficult to do, but that's how we become inclusive. That's how we develop narratives that are more open, more varied, uh, and, and more honest. Yeah. And this is, this is um, coming from an ethnographic background and, and working a lot with uh, indigenous people. It's, it's extraordinary how you can flip completely over in all forms of heritage if you just make space for other people to talk and it and just not control it yeah and I, i've seen it on the ground in all forms of heritage not just museums um yeah i was just going to bring in uh Taki, but that point because of that uh yeah colorful heritage and yeah. um yeah uh, i think what you were saying was most of the work you were doing was was interview based um and oral histories and letting people speak speak for themselves so yeah yeah, I mean, uh, the, the other side of it is that um, me being from a, an ethnic background, you know, and also being a woman, that's something which is unusual in, in heritage, because up to now, even in the ethnic, you know, sort of South Asian background, I would say it's only really been Bashir Man that's been noting down history, he's got books, there's been no other women talking about it, and my, I myself are not, are, are not, I am not a a historian by any means at all. In fact, my degree is completely in 
in the sort of sciences, but this is something I got interested in um, because my children were interested in this. They wanted to find out more. And from a woman perspective, I wanted to find out more. So I kind of got involved. And when we we're interviewing people, that's one of our main um, uh, the, the main work that we do is interviewing people from the South Asian community, and that's men and women across various faiths. And, you know, we're trying to gather histories from everybody. We're trying to keep it as balanced as possible. Mm -hmm. And same for, you know, when we're looking up um, information or facts, you know, we have a digital timeline on our website, and you'll see as many, of, of course, there's a lot more male kind of dominated entries, but I'm trying to bring in as many women um, interesting facts and you know information about them as well. In fact, recently I just did the her story, and not I did a four part series, and I find that there's just so much more still to be done, and I'm uncovering that as I go along. Yeah. So, and for me and my organisation, I am the only one that goes out, and I'll be invited to talk. So some of this I find it difficult to relate to because I am asked to come and do talks or to be on a panel, or I give talks often, or you know I'm the sort of front face. Even when the media come, you know, if the BBC are looking to do a documentary, they'll ask for me to come in and give a talk. And I think there was an antiques road trip documentary being made. So again, I was on that. You know, th there's so many opportunities out there. I think it's just the right people asking and knowing who to ask. So. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we should start taking some questions now. Oh, wow, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look here. Right. Oh, it's okay. So, um, going back to that final slide from the from the survey, um, there's just someone uh, asking from Twitter: uh, Does the gender of the event decision makers have an impact on the speakers, and in particular, the gender of the speakers selected to speak? We need more inclusive voices at those decision-making meetings. So yeah, going back to that kind of um, building in voices and perspectives right from the absolute outset. Um, yeah. Do we think that the decision, the the gender of the event decision makers, has an impact on the, on the um, the profile of um, or the, the yeah. Who gets to speak? I, I inevitably must do, I guess. Um, let's have a look, what else have we got in here? There's a question that came up about pay transparency, which I think is- Yes, I was wondering whether we, <laughs> we should talk about that. I suppose, um, I was kind of hoping to keep the focus on, on representation uh, in sort of um, that, that kind of wider perspective um, as uh, people who engage with heritage, heritage enthusiasts. Um, I, I would really like to discuss pay transparency, but I, I'm not sure it's, it really fits with this session. That's more a kind of organization. Do you mind if I just mention Museum Space Invaders for that then? Yes. Um, that just very briefly, everyone, uh, most of you know that um, there's been a Scottish chapter of Space Invaders, which is obviously a feminist activist group uh, that's London and Birmingham based, that uh, we just set up here as a Scottish chapter. It's about a month old. And if you want, I think I can even put the links up in the chat. Um, just to say that the three main issues that we are focusing on, which really overlap with what's going on today, are equal power and influence, which I think is essential, fair conditions in the day-to-day -day, uh, working environment, which could have a lot to do with this pay transparency, and we are looking at that, and having our stories told, I going back again to this issue of representation. And just as a fourth thing that we're doing within Scotland that we'd like to advance is the idea of mentoring it goes back to this idea of the pipeline, um, in particular for uh, mid-career, which is a real gap in the market mm. uh, and a, a huge demand from women uh, across, across the country. So I'll just leave that with you and I'll, I'll put up the chat and do join us with our, I think we've got our next meeting uh, coming up in early October.
Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a pitch, but it, <laughs> it clears the decks. We can talk about it's no, but we can talk about that stuff somewhere else. In other words, yeah, there's yeah, there's a nice nice intersection there. Um, yeah, and I, I I hope that the the, the survey and and some of the the work that we've been doing over the last couple of months will will um, will support and and intersect with initiatives like um, uh, yeah like space invaders. Um, okay, so we have another question here. I wonder if the panel could speak to the issue of inclusivity as an important aspect of improving diversity. Visibility is obviously part of this. Anybody like to take that on? Loretta? Well, I mean, it, I think it's very important in terms of representation. I mean, what was coming out from that survey was showing clearly that there are issues around the same people being asked to talk, the same class of or status of people being asked to be speakers at that certain conferences. And you could see that Community Heritage Conference drew up a lot of, you know, female speakers, mm -hmm. whereas, yeah. you know, other areas of, you know, subject areas in heritage, which is, you know, in inclusive of, you know, archaeology, inclusive of, you know, um, built environment and all of those kind of, you know, areas of speciality, industrial museums. These are kind of, you know, uh, almost where the unconscious bias are huh, because they are male dominated kind of seem to be being dominated. And obviously you will always find all of that coming. Um, becoming, you know, male speakers or manual, which is the first time I'm hearing this, manualist, not panelist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for me, we have to look at inclusive practices, embracing diversity in the first instance, embracing individual differences, but inclusive practices is about, you know, making sure that people, other than the same cliques or or school networks become the people that are actually being asked to do things. But inclusive practices will mean that you know, organizations are looking at their own flexibility, practices, policies that enable women you know, to actually become part of all of this career and presentation, representation across. If you look at the way women come in at the level of you know, graduates, is what I would say for those areas of work, this is not from you know, um, primary, secondary, it's from the graduates. And in the graduate cycle of you know, people who go for these areas of work, it's coming out clearly as well. Unless you are middle class, you, know, you come from middle class and you know, have money to do all of these postgraduate areas of work, then you're not likely to actually do, you know, continue that career. Women then tend to take career breaks. Mm -hmm. That also means, you know, they cut, cut them a little bit away from those career connections that they have made. Do we have inclusive um, flexibility in terms of policies? Things are changing, is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, we are we're now having parental here, which is cut across. We're now having um, paternity leave and all of those kind of things coming in, which means a shared responsibility for young, you know, um, parents at the moment, allowing women, you know, that kind of opportunity to come back into the workforce very quickly and continue to build, you know, their connections and also, you know, their networks in such a way that they are seen to be able to contribute. Then it gets to the management, you know, positions and you think, where are they? Where are these people that we thought, you know, have come back into it? Is that not a narrow you know, it becomes so narrow, the bottom becomes so narrow now that, you know, you then don't get this opportunity and you get say, certain people feel certain rules and they just call on their own networks. But I think if we have all of, you know, the workforce, all of the organization looking at their flexibility policies, mm -hmm. they are also flexible working, they are looking at their practices in terms of their values, then we can begin to put things in place in terms of leadership, in terms of mentoring, in terms of shadowing, even in terms of um, secondments and get people to be able to know. And when you are putting an event up, look out for people who might be you know, emerging 
you know, voices there to bring in into that. And I think there is something around that inclusive pre you know, practices that don't just look at gender only or certain people talking, but across board. And I think that's where, you know, this whole thing needs to come in from, which mm -hmm. is why I believe whether heritage organizations, which is full of enthusiasts, you know, and in terms yeah. of passion, let's continue with that. Yeah, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned cross sector um, and cross practice. So, um, I mean, my background's in archaeology, generally very, quite conservative in terms of <laughs> um, demographics and, um, and research practice. And I kind of feel, I, I always felt like, um, you know, we were a bit of the coos tail um, in terms of progressing on a lot of different issues and, you know, and left in the dust by museums. And particularly, I think uh, over the years, having uh, worked with a lot of creative practitioners like, like Tara um, and people who are in, engaged in uh, sort of polit political activism, I've picked up a, a lot and learned a lot from, from working with different groups with, um, with people who are um, working in different areas and, and different practices and just that cross-pollination I think is really has been really helpful maybe breaking down some of those barriers across different sectors mm -hmm. would help museums do seem, tend to be a bit more forward thinking I think. I, I think I think you will notice that too, you know at MGS you know Museums Gallery Scotland we've actually work cross sector mm -hmm. to promote different you know initiatives to mm -hmm. encourage more representation we still you know there's still a long way to go I won't say you know everything is all done and done and you know not been dusted or whatever but I think there is a lot that has been going on in terms of initiatives that you know MGS you know you know in terms of Transform Museum Transformers project. Wikimedia and in residence is one of those ones as well in terms of representation within content and all of that. But also looking at schools. Look, I mean, let's let's take for example curriculum. The curriculum looks needs to look at you know what areas of you know curriculum do young people exposed to. Look at STEM has been promoted and that in, including STEM there is part of you know, that initiative that is a gender equality mm -hmm. that is looking at you know, promoting STEM across right from primary school. Mm -hmm. Is that a way in which we look at heritage as part of this, not just when we get to that level of postgraduate studies, but also lo looking at you know, what careers, you know, opportunity or pathways you know, are available in the heritage organization sector in terms of, you know, MGS is doing, you know, something that we call um, you know, working with D, D, young, diverse young people workforce, DYW, to look at, you know, career roles and opportunities that yeah. young people might be, you know, involved in, in these areas of work. And that is part of, you know, one initiative that can give young people something to aspire to when they know what is going on in those yeah. On, on, the, on the subject of young people, we have another question here. Um, how do we start to deconstruct quickly <laughs> white male dominated development of policy uh, stroke content and heritage? Um, so what we see now to help young people um, imminently. I think that means, um, yeah. What are the, are there any kind of, um, are there any fast fixes? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to be the only one. Uh, so I leave it to people to go oh. first. <laughs> yeah. Giovanna, so, do, do you want to take that, Giovanna? Or? I, don't, I don't know because, I mean, there is no quick fix. No. We don't, how, how many decades have we been doing this? You know, I'm a, I'm a first stroke, second wave feminist, for God's sake. You know, I'm really old. And it's, it's hard to think. Uh, of a quick fix. What what I what I can say is I, I'm I'm and I, yeah I'd love to I, yeah, I'd love to see comments coming in. What of the the changes this year has been really interesting. I think there's been there's been a 
a tipping point between COVID and Black Lives Matter that I am talking to people I've never talked to in my life in a different way than I ever have. Uh, um, people in the street that I know, well, not people in the street, people that I know who are completely focused on their own uh, middle-class existences are turning around and saying, oh, I've just read this book on, on, on black history. And, uh, and I'm, I'm using that as an example of a, of a catalyst that when I think of the effect that the AIDS revolution and feminism had, and then of course, black history as well, and how they've intersected in producing a model of radical change. It, all, of, all three of those have continued to hit brick walls all along the way. I think for some reason, I'm feeling more optimistic right now. And it's partly to do with the fact that there is so much more information in circulation. If anything can deconstruct, it's knowledge that's circulating freely amongst people who have never, ever talked about this stuff before. And that's exciting. I'm sorry, I find that exciting. Whether or not it produces real stuff, but it is exciting. Yeah, a lot of misinformation out there as well. <laughs> well, I think the thing it's of, volume that's, that's yeah. Uh, I was going to add because of the survey, and and I, I that really worried me about the survey. And I'm I'm Italian, but I've lived in this country for a long time. Is the class system mm -hmm. that stands in the way that is a drag anchor on personal development, on cultural development, mm -hmm. on society generally. And I've been here so long, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I think, oh yeah, class, I have to remember that. And it is visible in the survey. It's interesting that it's very, very quiet in the survey, but it's actually, if you pick it apart, confidence issues for women, yes, management issues, career advancement issues, speaking up, finding a voice, agency. So much of that, I think, personally, this is just, I can only speak from personal experience, I think is connected to class issues right across the board, whatever ethnicity you are, it's, it's extraordinary. And, and there are obviously it affects working class men too. I, I see this and we are in a field that is full of very fortunate and very privileged people. Uh, I feel very fortunate, I feel very privileged, uh, but I just, I think that this is something that again is, a, is another brick wall. Yeah. Um, actually, we've just uh, we've, we've got a great question here. Um, do caring roles placed on women hinder women from being present or consuming or representing heritage? Should more be done acknowledging and regarding uh, childcare, especially in the time of homeworking? What can be done at a grassroots level? Hashtag everyday activism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody want to take that? Well, I mean, I I have two two young children, one old child and one younger child, and I think um, the kind of work that I do because it is quite flexible. You know, I can I'm given that flexibility to be able to work whether it is at weekends, it could be in the evening, and I've always done homeworking when it comes to working in the heritage sector as well. So it's never been a really big issue for me. Um, I think it's just having those opportunities. I'm sure, and I don't know if everyone gets those kind of opportunities. And I guess that's mm. one of the main attractions for me for this job, that it's something that I'm interested in, but at the same time, I can work on it in my own time. So that really helps me. It really helps to get the best out of me, actually. You know, I can do a lot because I can work on it in my own time. It's not fixed that I've got to do this between, you know, nine to three, and then that's it. I wouldn't get half the work that I get done in that, in, in that frame of mind. Yeah. I um, mean, I mentioned that earlier, you know, in terms of, you know, how this whole thing is, you know, cuts women off, you know, in terms of equal opportunity or the chances to participate or contribute, you know, to whatever is, you know, even interest them. And with COVID coming, <laughs> which is, you know, affected everybody adversely, but we're all kind of now looking at, you know, another benefit of it, which is online, you know, participation and things, working remotely or making connections. Even a face-to-face -face contact at the time was difficult enough for 
for young women, young mothers or parents even, I'm now going to cut across you know, both male and female to actually participate in you know, events, conferences and the like. But we're able to, um, how many people actually today, 100 people participating in this event today because many of them, perhaps online, are able to do so within their own homes or their own offices and the like. They don't have to travel three hours in order to get to an event which is going to last for one hour. Such is the flexibility approach of you know, online or social media or digital platforms. These are all the ways in which you know, we can make things people to participate inclusively. But then you can say the other flip coin is, you know, does everybody you know, have the digital tools to actually enable them to engage with all of this? And these are the things that organizations need to look at in terms of, you know, not just women, everybody being able to take advantage of whatever opportunities that there are to enable them to actually be inspired and also let them inspire others by participating in an event like this at their own, you know, at the time that they don't have to actually spend so much time on the road or so much the fact that I can't get out of the office or I cannot do so. So this is one way of looking at it. And it has enabled, you know, a lot of you know, people to be able to contribute. So young people are able to use social media. And this comes in terms of how do we get them to get involved? They like things very quickly. So social media is another way. Platforms such as, you know, maybe Google, we just have to look up the different approaches, but we need flexible policies, flexible working policies, inclusive policies in the workplace to enable young people, young parents, more, whether women or men, fraternity, make it even as a value of the organization so that people feel like, you know, they are empowered you know, to do things and don't necessarily feel guilty or trying to say, I, I can't do it because I don't want people to think that I'm doing it. It's all part of learning. It's all part of, you know, opportunity that there exists. And to be honest with you, the way NGS, the way we see it is that if you know more, the organization also benefit from it. And I think the great collaboration will help here in terms of, you know, using what is available, but let's put practices, inclusive practices, you know, uh, and embrace that in such a way that we embed it within the policies and practices of the organization. Yeah. Great. Can I just, mm -hmm. I just want to underline, I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Loretta is saying. I just wanted to underline that, that issue of policy implementation. So I think it really, it really is about like how you then move these sort of these initiatives that are about removing barriers based on, you know, socioeconomic status, based on gender, based on race, based on, you know, whatever it is that that, that becomes Im embedded in the policy of the organization or the group, even if you're just running like a, a small, whatever your thing is you're running, you have the capacity and the the opportunity to, to embed those and to try to think really creatively about how you make what you are doing more accessible. How do you begin to address or redress the digital divide, you know, in the group of people that you're working with, you know, because every one of us are in multiple communities, aren't we? So we all have that opportunity to think about it like that. But I think we, for those who are working with and within organizations and are in a position to craft policy, it's really about that because otherwise it just becomes someone's, um, it becomes, it becomes um, a habit for that group of people, that organization, as long as that person is in that role. And the minute someone else is in that role, then those kind of, those habits disappear, you know? So yeah. I think policy, crafting it into policy is, is key. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of change on the back of COVID in terms of the, the way that we work. <laughs> so it was really stating the obvious there. But um, yeah, that's, it's going to have big implications for, for everybody. But um, I think particularly for, uh, for people who are uh, for caring for children, um, I don't. I don't know how people survived home working and trying to trying to homeschool at the same time. It must have been. Did I chip in something on? Um, 
COVID side of things. <laughs> um, we actually had a couple of uh, TV shows in production when the sort of lockdown happened and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And uh, we weren't able to go to people's location to film them anymore. And at the start, uh, we kind of thought we wouldn't be able to do this sort of Zoom recording. And we thought viewing audiences at home wouldn't accept that as like telly. But there's been so much of it now. It's on the news. It's on so many different outlets. People are now accepting Zoom recordings and things as, as telly. And actually, it's giving people a lot more opportunity um, to be seen in the media. And so I was just totally agreeing with what Loretta was saying and also um, what Tara was saying um, uh, about being sort of digitally available as something for us. Um, I think having equal access to online, as Loretta was saying, is super important. But for us as well, um, we need to be able to find people as well and actually developing a digital presence. Um, it, it might not be something, I'm not on social media at all. I don't have any social media personally, our company does, but I don't. But um, sometimes when we're looking around, if we want to find people, it can be another responsibility for everybody to take on themselves is to make themselves digitally available. Um, you know, for, for us as a production company, we, we have limited hours in the day to attend, you know, events and things we try to, and we make a lot of connections. But at the end, a lot of it comes down to our looking online. Um, so being digitally available is really important to us. Okay, we're, we're kind of approaching the half past three mark. Um, so before we wind up, oh. <laughs> Can I just chip in, you know, at the back of the digital support, I could, you know, I know something around the funding, you know, in the chat box, box there. Um, can I say, as soon as, you know, the lockdown came and we, rec- we, we surveyed, you know, Museums Gallery Scotland, surveyed, you know, the sector around, you know, remote working and what will help in terms of, you know, digital. And a lot of, you know, what we got back was a lack of, you know, digital tools, you know, for people to enable them to engage. We actually got all of those data and fed those to Scottish government and, you know, since they provided funding for what we call the Digital Resilience Fund, you know, to the sector. And this is not just to the museums, also to heritage organizations across Scotland to enable them to actually buy you know, um, even up to iPad, laptop, and whatever, you know, to enable them to connect, you know, engage with their, with their communities and, you know, be able to, to, to do little things that they could have done to put themselves on online. And part of that is also part of the training on digital skills training and the like. So there is that bit about, about you know, addressing the digital divide kind of a thing or digital poverty, but I know Scottish government also is promoting digital inclusion, you know, funding and initiative. These are the kind of things, you know, that, you know, funders then think about before we move people to resilience, can we give them the, the kind of, you know, uh, tools that we enable them to continue to engage with their communities and MGS did that, you know, in, in terms of, you know, digital resilience for, and we're still actually given that the funding at the moment to support, you know, heritage organizations. You know. Okay, um, yeah, before we wind up, I think I'm going to invite uh, Alan and Natasha to come in from the, the chat zone party. They've been having a riot in there by the looks of it. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll maybe um, have a little chat about what happens next. I don't, um, I would say to Karen too, if she's available, she's very welcome to join. Um, yeah, so obviously there's been a, a, a lot of action in the chat room there. Um, we will be archiving all this and um, I haven't, uh, I've just been kind of skimming through it as we've been going along, but yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of kind of follow-up um, stuff to happen. So um, next, next steps, where do we go with this? Or is, is this, was this thing a, a little standalone um, kind of one-off event? I think this, if anything, it shows that we can welcome more collaboration because there's a need for it. So we've established the need for it now and it can grow in any way that we want it to grow. And I think even just making connections like this, it's fantastic. And we just have to keep the momentum going and the chat going. That's what I would say personally anyway. That, that sounds good. Um, I will be, <laughs> I'll be happy to take a wee breather after doors open days. Uh, I'm <laughs> taking a wee, uh, a wee week off, but um, 
yeah, planning to to regroup and and reconvene uh, to really get stuck into the survey data. You got a very high level overview. We've only had uh, what a sort of a week um, in amongst work and everything else to um, to pull this together. Uh, so yeah, we will be looking to to produce something that's a bit more detailed and nuanced down the line. I think the um, the volume of data that we got from the survey was astonishing. Um, and one thing that really struck me was how articulate women were about the issues and challenges that they face. Um, but also not just saying, oh, woe is me, this is, you know, this is what's happening, but also um, providing solutions and saying, well, let's, listen, this is how we change it. This is what we want to do. Um, and I think I think that's that's something from the the survey that we've got is actually we've got a huge amount of um, of solutions to work through, which is which is great, and we should be publishing that and making that available so that we can work on a framework of moving forward rather than just being pessimistic and thinking, well, it's not going to change. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um. It was really great hearing uh, from Tara about the um, the Wikipedia editing that she's been doing with the protests and suffragettes group. I think that's an it's an area that uh, is is often overlooked, and particularly in a heritage context, and how powerful a mechanism that is, and a, and a vehicle for for real for affecting real change. Um, so it would be it'd be really nice to see uh, other groups kind of take that that up as well. Oh. Hi Giovanna. Just a perspective from, I'm quite new to Scotland. I've only been here a year. Um, one of the things that really impresses me with this country is how well connected people are and how everybody seems to know each other. <laughs> it just seems, no, but coming from this ridiculous thing down south, where London sort of sucks all the oxygen out of networking. Mm -hmm. And I am deeply impressed with the commitment and, and the potential here. And it just strikes me that with all these different organizations that I'm hearing about now, to create some form of digital platform to connect a sort of, maybe it's a mega chat room or uh, an archive of you know, things like this survey. I'm just putting it out there. I mean, if there's ever a country that could do this, it's this one. So that's good to hear. <laughs> Can I say something yeah. super quickly? It's just that, um, so I think um, myself uh, working with, Wik we've, we've partnered with Wikimedia UK for everything that we've, we've done working with Wiki, which has been key. So that's the first thing to say is that we're, a, it's, a, it's primarily a voluntary project, but we're partnering with Wiki UK. So we've got that kind of um, really excellent guidance and obviously the the brilliant um, work of Sarah, Dr. Sarah Thomas, you know, I think we are very interested in continuing that, like to continuing to build a rhythm of these types of events, but also we'd really be happy to hear from other groups who want to help us co-host that, you know, real time. So it'd be good to have us, uh, maybe this is something we could speak to, you know, some of the people on the, I don't want to call anybody out, but some of the folks on the, on the panel and some of the folks who are watching, we'd be really keen to keep that up, you know, um, and to kind of share the sort of hosting, which I think is, it's one maybe small thread that can begin to do some of the things that you were saying, Ingrid, I don't want to take the, the focus off what you were saying or some of what the chat has been suggesting, which is maybe more kind of these types of events and more of this type of connectivity, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely up for uh, for co-hosting, Tara. Actually, we can have a follow-up chat about that after. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Um, Karen and Alan, uh, sorry, Tash and Alan, uh, what, what's, what's the chat been like in the chat room? Um, have we... Um. <laughs> I think I've just had a glimpse of what it's like being an air traffic controller. Yeah. It's been wonderful. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. There's so much and there's quite a lot that we didn't get through. Can I just um, piggyback on, on what one or two, including Tara, just said? If you watch Sarah, Sarah Thomas's piece for Doors Open Day, she does say at the end of it that she really wants more women to get involved in becoming Wikipedia en uh, editors. 
um, actively looking for it. I think the figure she came up with was 18.5% of entries on Wikipedia are women, which is ludicrously small. So she's actively um, looking for people to come and do that, looking for women to come and do that. Um, and she gave her email address at the end of that of that presentation. So people should go there and get in touch. Um, Sarah was actively encouraging that. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, that's that's us coming up for for twenty to four. Um, my head's burst. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I think I, I might be lying down in the dark room for a wee while um, after this. But uh, can I just say a huge thank you to all the panelists? We've lost two who had uh, who had meetings at half past three and had to go. Uh, so that was Alan and Graham. They've, um, they've got another thing on. Uh, so to Tara, Loretta, Saqib, Giovanna, and then uh, Tash and Alan for, um, for holding down the fort in, uh, in the chat room. And to Karen, who's done an enormous amount of work over the last couple of weeks in terms of promoting this event and, uh, and, and supporting us as we're uh, pulling together the, the presentation. So um, thank you all very much. And um, we also be saying a big thank you to you, Ingrid, as well as yeah. the, who has the vision to bring this together. Uh, we've we've just been doing the donkey work with the data, but I think this has been your um, your vision all the way through. So we want to say a big thank you to you for putting this. Absolutely. Together. Thank you. I'm going to get really embarrassed now. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me today. No, it's yeah, been, me too. It's been really good. Um, we did have a mailing list uh, as part of the survey, so we will be getting in contact with people who who signed up to that and giving you a bit of an update. Um, we have no uh, no website, Twitter, or or Facebook, or really identity of our own at the moment, um, and we'll just reconvene in the next uh, couple of weeks and I think try and figure out the road forward. But um, yeah, lovely to see everybody, and um, thank you very much. I am gonna now attempt to stop the live stream. Thank you very much, folks. Bye. Have a good day.